Hello, dear audience. I would like to welcome you today to our first dosimetry podcast, and I'm very happy about the realization of this new project. My name is Tino Ebnet from the PDW Dosimetry School, and in the future, my colleagues and me will inform you on a regular basis about various topics related to dosimetry of ionization radiation. Please feel free to be part of these podcasts and write us your questions. No matter what topic you are interested in, we will spare no effort to come back to you soon. Our email address is podcast at ptwdosimetry.com. And now to our first topic. What you always wanted to know about small field dosimetry, but were afraid to ask. I am pleased that I was able to get two top class scientists for an interview on this topic, the radiation oncologist, Dr. Christian Weisenberger from the private hospital center for radiotherapy in Freiburg and Dr. Jan Würfel from PDW Freiburg. Thank you very much, Dr. Weisenberger, for your great help and giving us a possibility to ask you some questions for our PDW podcast. And here is my first question. How important is the application of small fields in the today's medicine? Die Krankheitsbestrahlung hat in the last few years small field irradiation has gained tremendous importance in radiotherapy. In the past we used to irradiate with large fields, but due to the field of stereotaxy in the area of the head, in the area of the lungs, the liver, and also in the area of the body stem, we now have many small field irradiations. We are now also opening up a completely new field of indication, whereas multiple metastases, for example, could no longer be treated in the past, we are now able to irradiate wide variety of locations with small metastases. We call this oligometastatic concept. This concept enables us to irradiate multiple lung or brain metastases. However, it requires a special dosimetry that enables us to do this at a normal linear accelerator. Um, Dr. Weisenberger, do you have uh, an example for us? The typical example, which is certainly the first one to be used in this case, is the comparison between whole brain irradiation, which is used to be common, and the fact that stereotactically small metastases can now be irradiated individually. For example, we have the cyber knife, a special type of linear accelerator that is specialized for this purpose, but which is not available everywhere. We are now able to irradiate multiple brain metastases with a normal linear accelerator from Varian or Electa, for example. This small field irradiation requires a special planning technique and also high precision on the device. For patient positioning, for the implementation of the plans and of course in advance for determining the correct dosimetry. Which are the smallest field sizes irradiated by your linear accelerators? I have to admit that for this question I had to briefly consult with our physics department because they do the planning. Apparently we can actually plan down to a size of one centimeter by one centimeter. This means that we can also irradiate very very small findings, some of which are barely visible in MRI or CT. This is typically the case in the area of the head. What is your experience with clinical results using small fields? Excellent. The results are definitely excellent. It's certainly a big point of criticism that there is still a great variety in the treatment concepts. Some centers do single session irradiations with doses of 22 to 28 gray, for example. Others fractionate 3, 5 or in some cases 7 times and call it stereotaxy. The results are all comparable. We have few side effects and we have a high degree of therapeutic efficiency. This means that in the areas where we irradiate, it is to be expected that no tumor will return in the next few years. 
It goes without saying that in many cases these are metastasized diseases, where the fate of the patient is then decided at the remaining localization. But first of all, it is important for us to have a fast, well-manageable therapy with fewer side effects that we can offer patients. This was great. Thank you very much, Dr. Weisenberger. Thanks a lot. Before we now come to the medical physics questions in the field of small field dosimetry, I would like to say hello to our expert, Dr. Jan Bürfel. Hello, Jan. Hello, Tino. Hello, everybody. Jan has been working for PDW since 2006 on different projects concerning detector development, improvement of dosimetry systems and algorithms, and education. Since the beginning of the PDW Dosimetry School in 2014, he is one of our main speakers and regularly gives talks on small field dosimetry and detector physics background. Jan, as we have just learned, irradiation of small fields in radiotherapy is increasingly becoming the standard. This means that the dosimetry of small fields is also becoming more and more to be a standard. What brings me to the first question? <laughs> some time ago, I had some medical physicists in a dosimetry school class, and they thought that the dosimetry of small fields was basically identical to the dosimetry of large fields. The question is, do measurements in small fields differ from measurement in bigger field sizes, Jan? Valentino, indeed they do. For one thing, they are small and hard to find. There is more truth in that answer than you might think at first uh, thought. They really are small and you actually have to locate the field maximum for every small field when you measure in really small fields. And then there are some aspects which are really new and there are other aspects which are not really new but which have to be considered in more detail for small field measurements, and we will come to those in the course of this podcast. I am sure not everybody is trained to do dosimetry in small fields. We have to consider absolute dosimetry, relative dosimetry, measurements of output factors in small fields, for example. Are there protocols available to guide people for small field measurements? Yes, uh, there are protocols available. The most important one is TRS-483. This is an international protocol from the IAEA and the AAPM. And in this protocol, they have taken care to describe absolute dose measurements for Linux, which cannot provide a 10x10 10 10 CM field. And they have taken great care to describe how to measure output factors in small fields. And this includes correction factors, which is very important and very handy for the user. And it's the first code of practice that actually describes how to do small field measurements. Then there is a German protocol, it's called uh, DIN 6809-8. And similar to TRS, they describe the measurement of small field output factors and also give you some hints on how to measure profiles and PDDs. And to my knowledge, these are the only finished protocols that really describe the procedure. Both of them do not describe how to measure PDDs and profiles. For this, you basically have to rely on yourself. Last not least, from PDW, there's a brochure. It's called the Small Field Application Guide. And in this brochure, you can find lots of hints and ideas uh, how to measure in small fields. And I can also recommend this brochure for use. As you told me, the existing protocols for small field dosimetry are already some years old. What do I do if my new detector is not listed, for example, in the TRS-483? Well, the first thing, or something very important, you have to realize, if you think you can only work with detectors that are listed in TRS-483, this would mean to stop any detector development for all companies on the world. And this is, of course, nothing that we want. 
So in practice, if you want the latest detector technology and you've got a new detector which is not listed in TRS 4.3 or in the DIN or whichever document, then you should find correction factors which are measured according to TRS 4.3 and use these. In general, PDW will assist you to find such publications for your new detector. Jan, can you give us an example, please? How is the procedure if you want to add measurements for smaller field sizes below 4x4 centimeters to your existing ones from your former measurements? The first thing you have to do, you have to think about your cross calibration field size. There are basically two options. Number one is you use the machine specific reference field size, which is 10 by 10 at a standard LINAC or six centimeters at a circular cone at a cyber knife and so on. This is given in TRS 43. Or you use a small cross calibration field size, which is recommended in the German small field protocol. And this is usually four by four centimeter field size. The advantage of this so-called daisy chaining in a small cross calibration field size is if your detector has any effects which you do not know or which are not well characterized, such as dose rate dependence, temperature dependence, and so on, it's good to do cross calibration as close to the end use as possible. Anyway, you have to decide your cross calibration field size. The next step is you need correction factors for your detector or usually it's several detectors so you will need correction factors for all of them. If they are given already in the reference field size that you are going to use, it's fine. If not, you have to renormalize them to your cross calibration field size. Now you have organized all this, you can actually do the cross calibration. This is not mandatory because output factors are a relative measurement. But we recommend to do so because it is a test of what you do. If your uh, response, which you measure, or your um, calibration factor is roughly what you expect, you have done good work. So we recommend to do it. Now comes the actual measurement of the factor. In very small fields, the field center may slightly shift. So first thing you need to do, you measure two profiles. You deduce the real center of the field and you move the detector to this position and set this as new zero as the new cux. The next step is to repeat this, simply do the same thing for two reasons. Number one, to verify that you are now really in the field center. Number two, and this is important, to deduce the full width half maximum field size. You will need this field size for your correction factors. After we've done all this, you go to the field center and you now measure your output factor. All of this is, by the way, included in the new Beamscan software 4.4. So the software will guide you through this process of centering and measuring the output factor. Now, after you've done all this, you've got your table with output factors. You should not forget to actually apply your correction factors because only then those really are output factors. Before, uh, this was only ratios of measured uh, data values. And this you have to do for every small field size, and then you're done. When exactly we are talking about small fields, um, I mentioned already 4x4 four four centimeters from the German protocol, but is there a common agreement about that? It took the world pretty long to find something like a common agreement and in my feeling the discussion is still somewhat open but there are two definitions. Number one is the German protocol very simply says if any dimension of your field is smaller than four centimeters then you should consider it to be a small field. This is a rather simple approach but it's easy to apply and this is a focus of the German protocols they try to be very easily applicable. The more scientific approach is taken by TRS 483 and they say if you have one of the three following conditions fulfilled, so one of them is enough, then it's a small field. The first condition is you have a loss of laterally charged particle equilibrium. 
The second condition is that the field is smaller than your detector or that the dimension of the field is of a similar dimension than the dimension of the detector. And the last point is a partial occlusion of the photon source by the collimators. You mentioned the loss of lateral charged particle equilibrium. Could you explain more in detail what this means, please? Yes, of course. We take a field. This is not a small field, this is now a large field. This is the field border. And in this large field, it's created by photons in principle. So we have photons coming in, I call them gamma. And these photons, they pretty well stick to the field borders. They will create electrons. And these electrons will move away in all different directions. And if you now take one high energy photon and you think how far will this electron travel in this direction or on this one? This is the lateral direction, so we are talking about lateral equilibrium. So there is a certain distance that these electrons can travel. And this is the distance of the laterally charged particles. And this will happen at the field borders. It will also happen within the field. And if you now place yourself in one point, in your field, you will have a certain number of electrons coming in, of these laterally scattered electrons, and they come from this region. They do not come from outside, because this is outside of the range of those electrons, they come from somewhere inside here. Now we go to a small field. Again, we have our gammas, which create the field. And now we go again to a place in the beam. And this place or detector is used to get electrons from this travel distance. And you can see directly here there should be photons creating laterally scattered electrons which go to the detector, but there are no photons because the beam is too small. And this, this is the lack that we are talking about. So this is the lack of laterally charged particles. And it's a non-equilibrium effect and leads to the density perturbation which we will talk about later. I have heard about some effects that are only relevant when you measure in small fields. What effects are we talking about in detail? Basically, there are three effects, or three very important, most important small field effects. The first one is the volume averaging, and this can be illustrated best using a profile. Imagine that this is a small field profile. This is what would be measured with a perfect detector. Now consider a real detector that has a finite size. Example, this. So this is the size of the detector. It has one signal. The only thing that this detector can do and must do is to average over all the dose which is within its volume or within the sensitive volume. Now consider this profile here. This detector will average over the entire dose profile, which is within its sensitive volume. And this gives you a data point, which is about here. Now, if you consider moving this detector along the profile, you will end up with data points like this and like this. At the 50% isodose, in principle, the volume averaging is not a problem because you average over a straight line, but especially in the center of the field, you will severely reduce the signal which you measure. And this is the volume averaging, and um, it's the most important point in small field measurements, and there have already been radiation accidents because 
people were not aware of the volume averaging. The second very important aspect is anything you can group under geometry. This means, for example, that you have to be sure that you are in the center of the beam. It can also mean to look at your collimators. Are they well behaved or not? For example, if you open and close them or if you close and open them, is this the same? Are they reproducible? How is the accuracy? And so on. There are really many geometrical considerations. You have to be more careful in setting up your water phantom and all this. The third important aspect is the so-called density perturbation effect. And it actually stems from this, what we've already talked about. We have a lack of secondary charge particles. And this lack leads to the density perturbation effect. And measurement-wise, what happens is the signal is too large. So if you have volume effect, the signal is too low. So this is the volume effect. And if you have a density perturbation, the signal will be too high. So this is density perturbation. In practice, if you look at an output factor plot, This is the output factor. By the way, in some countries, this is called output ratio. And this is the field size. You will measure something like this. If you have a density perturbation, you will measure something which is too high in small fields. So the signal goes up. And if you have a volume average, volume averaging effect, you will measure something that is too low. Density perturbation happens for high density detectors, meaning a diamond, for example, or silicon as a material, they will measure something too high. Volume averaging happens for large detectors. These are usually air filled chambers. You will measure something too low. And last detail the density perturbation is not only present for high density detectors, but also for low density detectors, which means if you work with an air filled chamber, you will have both effects present. You will have the density perturbation and the volume averaging and both reduce the signal in small fields. You mentioned the density perturbation effect of diamond. Does this mean that I can expect a strong density perturbation effect for the micro diamond? Luckily, this is not the case. For the micro diamond, we have an interesting situation. If you look at the micro diamond, you basically have a small disk of diamond sitting on some kind of diamond material and uh, it has a diameter of 2.2 millimeters. Looking at this and considering really small fields, uh, usually the smallest fields which are in use are uh, 4 millimeters wide, meaning that 2.2 millimeters is already pretty close to the 4 millimeters. You can expect some kind of volume averaging from the diamond. At the same time, you can expect density perturbation from the diamond. So you will have the density perturbation increasing the signal in small fields and you will have the volume averaging reducing the signal in small fields, in very small fields both. And these effects compete. This is not perfect. In uh, very small fields, it's usually the density perturbation which is a bit stronger, but it leads to the fact that the micro diamond has correction factors less than 5% for all the field sizes considered in TRS-483. And for this reason, the micro diamond is very well suited for small field measurements, even though the density of diamond is fairly high. Since the beginnings in 1922, PDW has introduced a considerable number of detectors to the market. There are, of course, ionization chambers in different versions, diodes and diamond detectors. 
During our dosimetry school classes, I am often asked the question, which detector is the best for small field measurements? What is your opinion about that? Unfortunately, there is no best detector for small field measurements. Every small field detector has advantages and disadvantages. And it is something you will have to do as a user is to decide which detector you use. Most small field pro code of practices or information documents recommend to use two or better three detectors for your small field measurements. There are different classes. You can use silicon diodes, for example, they are very small, but they have a density perturbation effect and sometimes they have a dose rate dependence or even a temperature dependence. And you have them shielded or non-shielded, so you have to be careful to use non-shielded versions in small fields. You can use diamond, but you have volume and density perturbation, they counteract pretty well, but not perfect. And you have to pre aerate diamond, so in some view this is also not perfect, even though we think that it's a fairly easy to use detector. You could use an air fill chamber. They have been around for many, many years. They are very well understood, but you will have a strong volume effect and in addition to that, increasingly a density perturbation. For this reason, air fill chambers are not really well suited for very small field measurements. You could use film. It's a nice technique. You have, if you use a gaffchromic film, you will have a very good energy response and you will have a very good resolution, meaning that the volume effect is low, even though this depends a bit on how you actually scan your film. But using film is very tedious. It's lots of work. You have to know exactly what you do. You need protocols that include the timing when you do what and so on. It's really a small master thesis just to learn how to properly do film measurements. Last not least, you could try to work with a scintillator, but they need a Cherenkov correction, which works more or less okay in, for output factor measurements, even though if you want to be really accurate, you have to be very careful where you lead your cable along and so on. You need to be careful how to calibrate it, so there are many pitfalls on how to use scintillators. And if you start to scan, meaning you want to measure profiles of PDDs, there is not much experience around how well this Cherenkov correction works if you start to move your detector. It was originally designed for detectors which don't move. Altogether, this means use more than one detector and interpret the results. Okay. Now we know that several detectors will guide you to the target. When I have done three measurements with three different detectors and now I have three different results, which one of those would you trust? The most important thing to trust is your own brain. You need some background knowledge about the detectors which you use. You use those three detectors that give you three results. And then you look at them. You should trust most detectors which have small correction factors and detectors which have been around for a while. Meaning that there have been scientists who have looked at them, who have done some publications. These are both things that make your detector more trustworthy. And the third thing to make them trustworthy or not is your own background knowledge. And then looking at your three detectors, in some cases it's the average, in some cases you can say, well, I've seen my airfield detector give me something which is way too low, this was expected, I will not use the data, and so on. So you really have to look at your data, you have to consider what you do, and decide either to follow one detector, which you consider the best one, or to take possibly the average of some detectors. And you also have to consider the field size. The best detector for really small fields might not be the best detector for the field size range of 5 by 5 to 10 by 10 centimeters, for example. Jan, let me ask a question from relative to symmetry. We have diodes, diamonds and ionization chambers to choose from. The smallest detector will give me the sharpest penumbra. Does this mean 
the smallest detector is the best detector? Uh, this is a very interesting question and uh, this has actually changed. Until a few years ago people thought the sharpest penumbra is the best penumbra. And this comes from old measurement data where people have used air-filled chambers and made them smaller and smaller and have shown that the penumbra becomes sharper the smaller this detector is. Nowadays we know that there's a density perturbation and uh, a volume effect and that this density perturbation will give you an error which goes in the other direction in very small fields. And this also happens at profiles. If you... let's look at a theoretically perfect profile. So let's make it in black. So this is the perfect penumbra. This is what we want to measure. If you measure this with a more or less perfect small air filled chamber, you will have a bit of volume averaging and you will have density perturbation. So you will get something like this. So this is air. If you measure the same profile with a small high density detector, meaning as a high density, the same thing will happen here as will happen in a small field. You will have an increase of the signal here, then, and the same happens at the lower part of the curve. And this is a penumbra that is too sharp. If you have a small high density detector, you will not measure the best or the most accurate penumbra. You will measure something that looks great, but it's not the truth. The perfect detector that is the black line and if you want something which is very close to perfect you need something that has density of one and is really really small hard to get possibly with a scintillator but as i told you earlier scanning with a scintillator is really not so easy and what comes relatively close to the truth is the micro diamond considering what happens for small field output factors we expect that the micro diamond is still on the high density side but is closer micro diamond yeah. it's still on the high density side but it is very close to the true penumbra this is our expectation more or less shown in Monte Carlo simulations but this is really very difficult to find out really in detail and with a high accuracy which detector gives you the perfect penumbra. The good news is the micro diamond is fairly close. And this was the small silicon detector. Another question that I am asked very often in our dosimetry school classes is do I need a reference chamber for small field measurements. What can you tell me about that? There are several answers to this question. Um, in principle, <clears throat> you need the reference chamber to make sure that your LINAC is stable. If for whatever reasons you know that your LINAC is stable, you simply measure without a reference. And this is fairly common. Many people do it. But most of those do not check if the LINAC is stable. This is very important. If you believe in your LINAC, this is how I call this option, if you believe in your LINAC, make sure that it's stable. To find out if your LINAC is stable, you will need to record signal over time. If you use PTW software, this can be accomplished using the so-called stationary scan mode. In this mode, the detector will not move, it will only record signal over time, and you need to do this with the field and the reference detector in place. And then you can see if the signal is really stable. I correct. It will also work if you only use the field detector. And this you really have to check. And now, knowing that your LINAC is stable, it is in principle an option to measure without reference. If it's a good idea or not is something you have to decide for yourself. Most people feel better if they use a reference. Now, if you decide to use a reference, this is what we recommend.
This is a water phantom. Some water inside. And we have a field detector that's measuring our signal with some cable. And the PTW solution is the T-REF chamber. And it's a dose area product chamber. The idea is that the entire beam is within the chamber. This would be a classical situation where you can use the T-REF chamber. If you do it, you will have something in the beam. Many people don't like to have objects in the beam because they are afraid the beam might be perturbed. There are two things which can happen when you have an object in the beam. Number one is beam hardening. And since the density of this chamber is very low, beam hardening really is something you do not need to consider for this measurement. The second thing is you might create secondary electrons in the chamber which might be measured. So you might have an electron coming down here. And if you now measure the PDD in this spot, meaning in very flat water, this is the beginning of the PDD, it could be that you measure an increased signal because of these electrons. We wanted to make sure that this is not the case. Hence, we really tried it out. We did many measurements and we verified that if this distance is more than 20 centimeters, this is the minimum distance, so you need to be 20 centimeters away or more, then these electrons are not measured. The reason is very simple. If you have 20 centimeters, this is lots of space, all the electrons created here, they will move out of the beam and they will not be recorded by the detector. And for this reason, we are of the opinion that the TREF is very well suited as a reference chamber for small fit measurements. In addition to the 20 centimeters, you should also respect the maximum field size. It's only allowed up to five by five square centimeters. And this is enough. In larger fields, you can use the classical approach and put some kind of chamber in the edge of your beam. And with this, I come to the last point. If you do not like to believe in your LINAC and you do not like the TREF, what you can do is you put it away, record your PDD and record it a second time, simply twice. Then you look at the data, you compare your PDDs and if they are alike, then the measurement was okay. You can then average them together, reducing the measurement noise a little bit. It works, it's great, but it takes lots of time. For practical reasons, we recommend the Tilbury Chamber. Jan, many thanks for this great expert question and answer session on small field dosimetry. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to take part in this podcast. Jan, now that we have started our podcast series with this pilot podcast, would you support us again if we want to shoot a second part about measurements in small field dosimetry? Of course, Tino, I'm always there for you. If you have further questions about this or a completely different topic, then please send us your questions to podcast at pdwdosimetry.com. We will evaluate your questions and if possible, answer them in another podcast on this channel. Thank you for watching and see you soon, your PDW Dosimetry team.